I I'm happy to be the, uh, the third Canuck in a row here. Go Phil and go Carly. I am also a Canuck. Go Canada! Yes, go Canada. I am, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge two people right here who have worked so hard. Kim and Jeff Vontre. Let's hear it. Um, I've been to China twice now, and the first time was uh, about uh, 20 years ago. I did a documentary over there, and we went to the Great Wall, and they literally, outside the Great Wall, the bathroom facilities were literally a concrete block building with a hole cut in the center of the building. Th those were the, the bathroom facilities at the Great Wall 20, 25 years ago. Returned three weeks ago, which I will talk about in a moment, and it's unbelievable what has happened there. Every place we looked were cranes and high rises. And China is on the verge of basically taking over the world if they haven't already. So, with what's going on in the cetacean world in China is, I don't want to be doom and gloom up here, but it is, it is very, very ominous. So let me walk through, uh, first of all, the research I did. Uh, in addition to going to China a few weeks ago with our crew, uh, I also did a lot of research, talked to a lot of people. My son uh, lives in Indonesia. Uh, he's in the television business and works uh, with the Chinese a lot. And uh, so part of this was based on, uh, in, on discussions with him and others. And also a lot of the information that I will give you came from a book called The Chinese Dream the Rise of the World's lar Largest Middle Class and What It Means to You by Helen Wang. It, it's a great book. If you're inter interested in China, I would highly recommend it. So let me start through um, the presentation here and uh, we'll move through and at the end I, I, I would like to show you um, uh, a two-minute trailer from our film Long Gone Wild. People ask if you know, is this another blackfish? No, it is not another blackfish. It picks up where blackfish left off um, and takes us through uh, what's happened since then, the blackfish effect. Uh, it talks, of, we're talking about Russia, China, and uh, the amazing whale sanctuary project, which was just being discussed here recently. Um, and I always say, no, it's not another blackfish because blackfish cannot be duplicated. Gabriella just did a marvelous job with that film and obviously completely changed the dynamics of what, what is going on in the captivity world with her work. And it was just an amazing film. Steven Spielberg once said, you know, he was never going to make uh, uh, a sequel to E.T because E.T. could not be duplicated, and I, and I really don't think Blackfish could, so that is not our intent at all, but we will show you a, a brief trailer when I'm done here. So let's look at the numbers. In 2000, the middle class of China was approximately three million people. Here are the numbers in 2025, the estimated numbers. 800 million in the middle class of China. Cities with one million plus people, 220. Does anybody have any idea how many U.S. cities have a million plus? Anybody? 10, 20? Less than 10. Less than 10. 10 is the winner. 10 cities. Think about it, 222 in China in, in uh, 2025. Wow. New skyscrapers. 50,000, that's the equivalent of 10 New York cities. This is all happening in the next 
10 years or so. The Communist Party backs 80% of major enterprises. The Communist Party is the largest capitalist in China. And what they do is, and what is going to make this, this uh, challenge in China, which we'll, I will talk about in a bit, what's going to make this really difficult is the fact that there is a lot of corruption and there are a lot of uh, the party members who are connected with the individual businesses. So what they do is they connect and they come together and they work to uh, build the businesses uh, with the help of the party members who are often the village leaders or the town leaders and uh, leaders in the cities and so it creates a lot of corruption and a lot of issues in terms of trying to ever get any anywhere with any of these people because of that corruption. Here is the mindset, a lot of this is coming from Helen Wang's book Deng Xiaoping said back when he really initiated what was going on, uh, that this revamping in China, this communist slash capitalist enterprise they had, he said to get rich is glorious. And they've taken it from there. The exploding middle class really wants it all. Money is king and status is queen. Everywhere you go in China now, in the cities, and the vast majority of people now living in China, the vast majority of this growing middle class, which is now between 300 and 500 million people, it's hard to get an exact number on it, and growing to that 800 million or so, that may even be a conservative number. There's some people, McKinsey and Company is one of the, uh, consulting firms who believes that could be as high as a billion people um, by 2025. Be fashionable or be left, be or be left behind is, is the mantra of many of the Chinese middle class. They're very, very status oriented. And, and, and I don't mean to do a broad brush over everybody, certainly like in this country or any country, and in China is no exception, it's not everybody, but it's, it's a movement that is happening, it's real, it's vibrant, and the people there uh, really are connected to this movement of status and money and position. And according to Helen in her book, this is not something that, that, um, that I necessarily noticed or felt there, but as she's saying, she, uh, there's a, a, a real moral decay going on because of this focus on money and status and corruption. Here are the marine parks currently in China. Just take a moment to look at that. 39 with 18 under construction right now and that may be a very modest estimate. Um, we, uh, when we were in China, we met with a uh, reporter from Reuters who uh, works out of Hong Kong, and she is doing a story about the aquatic parks in China. She says there may be as many as 54 in China. It's very hard to get information out of that country. So that's the number, and that's, uh, that's where it's going. And uh, if you think about SeaWorld in its heyday, SeaWorld had four parks, right? The three they have now, plus there was a park in Ohio, which they, they closed back when Blackstone Company bought uh, SeaWorld, Blackstone Group. So they only had three, have three, had four. They already have 39 and and growing. I think you all know Rick O'Berry from, uh, yeah, let's hear it for Rick. <laughs> Rick went with us to China. Um, 
Rick, of course, his badge of honor is getting arrested. <laughs> and I said, Rick, we do not want to get arrested in China. Uh, I'm not sure that registered with him. <laughs> he called me yesterday, and here's, here's a, a, a real spark of hopefully good news in this. Rick called me yesterday, and he said, I've got some breaking news, as he called it. I said, what is it? He said, I'll send you an email. Here is uh, uh, the essence of that email. It's not up here because I just didn't have time to, to do it. This is out of Russia. The Prosecutor General's Office demands the initi initiation of a criminal fraud investigation into the catch and illegal sale of killer whales from Russia's Far East. Four commercial organizations provided false information about the intent, intention to use killer whales in what they called cultural and education activities in 2012 to 2015. These are the whales that went to the Moskvarium in Moscow, the three whales, Narnia, Nord, and Juliet, they call her, the three whales. They are performing in, in, in Moscow right now. We had a, a Russian cameraman go into the Mosbury and we have footage of that and we have footage of the whales. That's where they came from. And the price, 1.2 million per orca, and the damage caused to the Russian Federation was 4.3 million US. What that means, I'm not sure. Maybe Putin didn't get his share of the pie. I'm not sure what the 4.3 million Russian Federation is. But they had granted permits to uh, capture 10 more orcas, and that may be in jeopardy now. So, piece of good news out of Russia. Uh, so back to Rick and China. This is the hotel right next, to, we were in Chimlong Park. Let me go back here. Chimlong Park is right down in the bottom right corner of your screen there, right across from Hong Kong. It is one of the largest parks. It's been open, I believe, a couple of years. Um, our, my, I'm sorry? Taiwan, nothing, sorry. Across okay, Taiwan. across from Taiwan, thank you. Um, uh, our crew, we were the only non-Chinese in the park. So they're not building these parks for the tourism trade, they're building them for this exploding middle class. This hotel was right next to Chai Mong Park. And there are four massive hotels. One is called the Penguin Hotel. This is a this is a different one. I forget the name, but these are massive hotels, all marble. You can see Rick was just. <laughs> you can see the look on his face. It's like, what is this? That's the entrance. This is one of the rides there. That goes between these two walruses, and the walrus, the, the, the live walruses are right down below on the left of this. This is where they're, this is where they're held. And you can imagine the screaming people and kids going down this ride because it's a water ride and it goes down underneath a tunnel and ends up down at the bottom somewhere, but these, the ride comes around the top and goes right down and this is constantly, every day, so imagine, um, imagine what that does to the walruses. Even worse than smooshy. I never thought I'd have to follow a walrus in a conversation and yeah. talk, but smooshy loves smooshy. So um, this, is, this is the kind of, of setup they have. It's very reminiscent of, you know, what SeaWorld and the parks here would have done years ago. Here's the Beluga show. Again, 
looks exactly like what goes on here. They're doing their circus tricks for food. Um, the trainers get in the water with the belugas. They ride around on their backs. Um, it's the same old story that we've seen here for so many years. Now, they have, as far as we know, nine killer whales, live caught by the Russians, off-site in this park in China, Chimlong Park. The plan is to breed the whales and sell them to the other parks. That is the plan. This is what it looks like, $500 million to build this uh, whale museum, they call it. What is that called? The Marine Science Museum, they call it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sure, the science. 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 Yeah, right, science, uh huh. Science and education, research and education. Here are the orcas with their trainers. Now, what happened here is that when the whales first came in, the Chinese thought this was really cool. You know, this is, this is a big deal, and so they invited the media in. And the media came and they took pictures and they did news reports. And then all of a sudden, crickets, radio silence. They decided that, whoa, wait a minute, maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe we're going to get some blowback as SeaWorld has done. The one thing about the Chinese, certainly, that I think is uh, beyond any, uh, any doubt is the fact that they're smart. So they immediately backed off. This is the future. These are the kind of parks that they're planning to build. SeaWorld, as I'm sure many of you know, is now owned 21% by a group called Zhonghong Group, which is a conglomerate out of China. And SeaWorld and Zhonghong had recently announced their first park. There was no mention of orcas whatsoever. I'm sure SeaWorld is certainly not going to, making sure that that, that word doesn't get out in any of these conversations. But I think we all have a sense of, of where this could go. So we decided that since we weren't sure where the whales were, that we would try to find them. <laughs> now this, <laughs> with Rick O'Berry with you, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a dicey thing to do, right? But we, what we did is we got the GPS coordinates, and we got them from three different sources, one of which was a, a friend of Rick's out of Hong Kong. So we were pretty sure that we had the right coordinates. And we could see from the satellite images that the building that was in the coordinates looked like the building that we'd seen these photos from, in addition to the one I showed you with the orcas and um, the trainers, we had some other photos, so we could sort of tell the color of the building was blue and white. We knew that. So we uh, hired a, uh, in addition to our own cameraman who is here, Josh, who is an incredible guy up there. Oh, Josh. <laughs> um, we hired a Chinese camera guy who went with us, drove his van, we follow the GPS, and we get to, it's, it's actually very close to Chimelong Park, it's about a mile away, down this back road, through like a countryside almost. And we come to the first guard station, and I thought, oh well, that's it. He opens the gate. We drive through. We come to a second guard station. He starts yelling at our driver. What are you doing here? Apparently, of course, we couldn't understand a word because they were speaking Chinese. We're sitting there and thinking, okay, now we're definitely stopped. The gate opens. We drive through. We drive around this winding road and land in front of a construction site, this huge construction site, the size of a, 
of a soccer field, a football field. And at one o'clock, or at, uh, yes, at one o'clock, we could see the building. That was what the GPS told us where it was. And Rick says, let's go. Of course he did. I love Rick. Of course he did. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. So we start across, and I'm looking at the Chinese camera guy, and I said, are, are, are we, what's going on? Should we be doing this? And he said, there's a guard station over there. Let's wander over by the guard station and see if he says anything. So we wander over that way, myself and Cliff was his American name, the camera operator. I took look back and Josh and Rick are heading over toward the building. They're <laughs> moving through bushes and going over this little creek and Josh is following him with the camera. And here are a few of those shots. There we were, there we, there we are at, at the building. You can see it in the background, blue and white. There's Rick <laughs> at the fence. Another shot of Rick at the fence. <laughs> and what, what we could see back here, if you look in here, there's a water, water filtration system. We saw refrigerated trucks, which of course have the fish. We ended up going around this building, around the back of the building, and we went through another guard station. There was no guard there. We think he might have been at lunch. And now we are, we've not, we've not only been trespassing, now we're double trespassing, because we're right in this complex. And we saw one of the big crates that they move orcas in, and a stretcher. Now this building, I don't believe, was big enough to hold the nine orcas, if all nine are still there. But there, clearly it was big enough to have a few of them which may have been there for breeding purposes. We asked a construction worker what the building was. He says it was the mammal control center. That that's where they had all the mammals. Josh and Cliff, who were then together, Rick and I were moving off around this building, they saw a sea lion in one of the buildings. Now we were just about to look in the windows of this building. Um, uh, back around at the side. We were about to look in the building when a couple of uh, western looking trainers came out with their cell phones in their hands. What are you doing here? We just dodged it and moved past it. Oh, we're, we're just stop by. We're just here to check things out and we're out of here. So Rick and I head off and we start back toward where the car was. Cliff and Josh are behind us. And that's what happened. Oh, <laughs> oh that's my movie. That, that, <laughs> I'm kidding. I know. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's from the Blues Brothers. Blues Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, <laughs> that's what really happened. No problem. <laughs> so this is what greeted us when we got back to the car. And uh, <laughs> if it had not have been so serious, it would have been a Saturday Night Live skit because Rick is in the back of the van faking a heat stroke. <laughs> He's got his shirt off. I need water, I need water. <laughs> and these, this group called their supervisor. He called his supervisor. To make a long story short, we were there for an hour and a half. Josh, in his wisdom, who was following behind us, had all of our media cards out, hidden in his back pocket. When he got to me, he slipped them to me. I told the, the 
through the interpreter that I had to go check on Rick. And so I got into the car and hid the cards in the car. Now they took our phones, they took, uh, they uh, erased footage that we'd shot on our cell phones, so they knew what they were doing, but they never asked for the cards. And so we were, there was one in the camera which they reformatted, which most of you know what that does is it takes off, it erases everything. But we still had the footage that we'd shot the day before at Chime Long Park and the footage that we had there. When we drove away, and it was, it was really hot. I think after, I think for a while, Rick was faking it and then he wasn't. I think he really was feeling, it was very hot and humid. So we drove off and I said to the, uh, to the Chinese driver, I said, how did that happen? I thought we were in a gulag for sure. And he said, they didn't want the report going up the line and that they wanted to cover their own asses basically and that they were concerned how did these guys get by three guard stations and get into this place in the first place so off we went and um, we were very fortunate to get out of there without some serious repercussions and losing everything that we had shot there so we were we were very thankful and, and thankful for cliff who was a very mild-mannered guy but he he handled it very well so what are the takeaways sea world three aquatic parks china 20 times that many orca performances in china mega mega aquariums in my opinion inevitable once started, almost impossible to stop. What can be done? Work with the China Cetacean Alliance. Naomi and the Animal Welfare Institute and others are working diligently with the China Cetacean Alliance to, uh, yes, let's hear it. <laughs> Are working diligently to to address this when Naomi in her talk yesterday said there is hope and yes there is and the reason is is because in China they are trying to be very progressive on so many fronts the environment taking over from the US because of you know who in the White House and uh, they've stopped the ivory trade and on many fronts, they, have, they, they are making progress. This, this would be completely regressive. It would take them back 30, 40, 50 years. And in China, you only have to convince one or two or three people. You don't have to worry about all of the entanglements, all the politics that go on, say, in this country or in Canada one person can make the decision and say there's not going to be orcas and there won't be any orcas can that happen in time before it starts who knows i don't know that it can really i'm hopeful we all need to work on this because once the orcas start performing as all of you know compared to belugas or dolphins it's like having pa pavarotti sing opera every performance the orcas are the kings they come out and the crowds just go crazy and once that starts and the turnstiles start clicking in china i don't know how to i don't know how we would stop it learn from ebay what i mean by that very quickly is when um, meg whitman was ceo of ebay Back a few years ago, she said, whoever wins China wins the world. And eBay was felt that they could take over China the same way they took over America. They went in there with a German uh, general manager and a US technical officer, neither of whom spoke Chinese, neither of whom had ever lived there and knew anything about the culture. And this little guy, about five foot six or five foot four, a former English teacher, said, I can beat him. 
His name was Jack Ma, and he built a company called Alibaba, and he buried eBay in China. And the, I think the lesson there is don't try to do things in China the way we do them here. I think what we need to do in terms of educating them and trying to get this message across about how brutal it is to keep these magnificent animals, orcas and beluga whales and dolphins and yes, uh, walruses, all of them, to keep them in captivity is criminal. These animals are imprisoned for life for crimes that don't, that don't exist. And the way to approach that with the Chinese is not the way we would approach it here. And I know uh, Naomi and others understand that and are working on that, but for those of you who may be interested in getting involved in this, uh, in this mission, um, I think there's a real lesson there. So the Russians are, are live capturing these whales. Hopefully this news that, that Rick got to me yesterday will be helpful. And uh, we can try to stop this and stop the capture because these, of course, these whales that they will be capturing in the Sea of Okhotsk in Eastern Russia, out in the middle of nowhere and sending to China, no doubt are mammal-eating orcas, not fish-eating orcas. Here, residents and transients, these would be transients. And transients in captivity, are what are they feeding them? Fish. These guys, they don't eat fish. They don't want fish. So it's, just, it's, it's a double whammy. We've got to do our best to stop it. Thank you.